This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 247, recorded on August 23rd, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. I don't see you today. You know, no, uh, you probably just have a generic uh, static picture of me, right? Yeah, it's the one yep. with, in your room there, not like yeah, last I've got, week. I've got you with a piercing gaze looking into the camera. Piercing. Yeah. As in someone with fangs. Right. Well, we'll do the video again sometime. That yeah. was fun. Yeah, that was that was fun. Also joining us from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Howdy there, everybody. I see your smiling face up on my monitor. There I am. Happy as a clam. Everything good down there? And Everything is just dandy. Gainesburg? Uh, Gainesville, come on. I think Gainesburg better. Well, okay, so you can rename it, or you can take it up with the town council. Uh, I have to report to you that it is uh, 80 degree, 83 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 Celsius, under an angry sky and raining. Oh, you got rain down there. Huh? We do. We've had a lot of, this has been real Florida this summer. It's been great. We've got a lot of rain. Oh, here it's 28C, 36% humidity. Winds out of the north at 16 kilometers an hour. It's partly cloudy. We had a big rainstorm yesterday. Yeah, pretty well, much the same weather here, but not quite as much rain as <clears throat> Also joining us from North Central, <laughs> from Ann Arbor, Michigan, <laughs> Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Would North Central Michigan work? No. No, Southeast Michigan would work. Yeah, it's too complicated. Right. <laughs> How's the weather out there? It's 79 degrees, not a cloud in the sky. It's beautiful. Wonderful. Today we have a special guest in studio, someone who has been on TWIV several times times before. He's from the Center for Infection and Immunity here at Columbia University. Ian Lipkin, welcome to TWIV, Ian. Thank you. Good to have you back. I'm a cheap date. You are cheap. <laughs> you have to be careful, though, because you'll stop being a special guest at some point. Yeah. Well, what is the, the number of episodes, right? I don't know. It's sort of like, how many nucleotides makes a virus? <laughs> These are deep questions. <laughs> Uh, Ian called me this morning, and uh, we we decided it would be good to have him on TWIV and talk about the MERS coronavirus, and uh, that's something you're working on in your laboratory. In fact, there was a an article in Emerging Infectious Diseases this week uh, from your laboratory describing uh, your work on that or some of it, so we thought we'd talk about that. So we have talked a little bit about MERS coronavirus on TWIV before, um, but why don't you tell us um, how you got into this? Well, I was contacted in October of 2012 by somebody by the name of Shamshading Fugbo, who is, is that a great name? Wow. Great name. <laughs> awesome. Uh, his, his email address is loungeboy.yahoo, uh, which... Uh, <laughs> It turns out to be actually his name. It's not what it sounds like. But um, people didn't take it seriously. But I actually read the message, which is generally a good idea, particularly when they come in very, very late at night. It's either that or it has to do with penile enlargement or wanting to sell you <laughs> millions of dollars worth if you'll just send all your information. So in any event, um, he had recently been engaged by the uh, Ministry of Health of Saudi Arabia to... Uh, build a zoonotic program and he was trying to track down what had happened uh, with the first case and where this individual might have become infected um, with this new virus and uh, he invited me to participate and get a group together to go to Saudi Arabia to try to find the source of the infection so I put together a team uh, of people from Columbia and from EcoHealth Alliance with whom we do a lot of work and uh, I was on my way actually to Cambridge for a meeting and I joined up with the rest of the team in Frankfurt and we continued on to Saudi Arabia and we went to Bisha, which is where the index case 
uh, was first identified. How long ago was this now? This is October of 2012. Wow. Okay. And uh, so we landed in Riyadh, and we immediately got into another plane and flew to Bisha, which is a very small town. Now, were you there before or after the Hajj? This is before. Okay. And, and how long after the uh, first identification of this? This is, a, this is a few weeks. So just a few weeks? Correct. Okay. And um, getting all this gear together to do collections uh, rapidly is, uh, is no mean feat. So my colleagues at EcoHealth and, and uh, Columbia pulled together the various nets that you need to trap bats. So these are what is known as harp nets, which basically are monofilament line. It looks like a harp, and the animals at the mouth of a cave or a dwelling will fly into this monofilament line and flitter down where they're collected on a, on a, on a uh, tarp or mist nets that you hang between trees and so forth. So the first thing that we did was to go and meet with the family of the man who had died. He had three wives. He was about to uh, engage a fourth, and he had three houses, one for each of these wives. We were not allowed to speak with them directly, but we could meet with the sons uh, and the grandsons. And he lived in a series of at a very simple modern houses uh, at the edge of a date plantation, which was quite, um, most of the bait, dates had died, but he actually was in the business of growing dates and packaging them, and so there was a lot of opportunity, we thought, for collecting either fruit bats or insectivorous bats in the area. But when we went on top of his house that evening... So even with three wives, he was still dating. He was very... He was, a, you know, he's enti <laughs> he was entitled to four. Entitled to four, that's He was right. entitled to four. And, um, wow. you know, and uh, the first three did have tenure. Yeah. So that part was okay. And uh, poor Vince, he, this is not going the way he wants this talk <laughs> to go. But I think it'll be interesting. <laughs> And it makes me a special guest, as opposed to some guy who just talks about nucleotides. Wherever it goes. We'll get to nucleotides <laughs> okay. eventually. So uh, there are only 190 of them, so we have to stretch it out here, Vince. <laughs> <laughs> so the, um, so uh, it was a very interesting evening that first evening because um, they wanted to uh, sacrifice a sheep. I wasn't really interested in eating the sheep, and all the sheep were looking at me warily as I was going because it looked like we had this big entourage. That's a problem. Sheep recognize that. And when I didn't want the sheep, they were going to sacrifice camel. In retrospect, that might have been more interesting. But I wasn't interested either sheep or camel, so we ate dates and drank tea, and it was very nice. Uh, and then uh, we looked for bats. We really didn't see any bats. So the following day, we went to his warehouse, which was about uh, 10 kilometers away. This was an even more arid area, and it was a... He had a large warehouse, and behind this warehouse, uh, there were uh, some very creaky iron doors and managed to open. And in the back, we saw um, outhouses and a garden and came back that night when we suspected there would be bats. And there were plenty of bats, uh, I would say well over 100, and they were flitting about within two to three meters of the, of the ground surface. And then that was the basis for our initiating our collection of those sites. So in that first trip, we collected at his warehouse. We collected um, in the town of Bishi itself and several old ruins uh, and put all those materials together, fully anticipating that because we left a cold shipper with liquid nitrogen, that everything would be fine. Um, but uh, the first shipment arrived instead of using World Courier, which is my choice in that part of the world, they used FedEx, and FedEx opened up the lid of the dry shipper, and 72 hours later, when we received the samples, they were all thawed. Wow. So, and it was an enormous disappointment, as you might imagine. You so, didn't even bother with those, right? No, we did. We studied them. That's, in fact, where we found the fragment. Huh. So, we opened the tubes had all been collected and labeled, you know, individual freezer tubes and so forth. And in these you have rectal swabs, oral swabs, um, fecal pellets, serum, um, wing punches that were used for DNA analysis to identify the, the bat species, 
And those samples came back in October, and we began working them up. Now, at this point, we had no MERS constructs in the lab. We had no human samples in the lab. We had MERS sequences on the computer, but that was really it, and, and, and there was nothing else there. So um, Nishe Mishra, who's the fellow who was working these up, began extracting them. Mm-hmm. And very early on, with an RDRP amplification, he obtained a sequence which was 190 nucleotides, which was identical to the Erasmus sequence. And as we R- began... RDRP being the signature sequence for the viral polymerase, right? Correct. Correct. Thank okay. you for getting me away from the acronyms. Um, though I pr- don't promise to stay away from them. because I slip okay. And we'll, slip keep into you, them. we'll keep you honest. So... Um, and that's essentially where we were as we began looking at all these other samples. We never found it again. Did you go back and collect more? So that's later. But I'm just okay. what I'm trying to say is we repeatedly found that sequence in association with that one bat sample, no other bat samples. Everything else was stone cold negative. And that was uh, from a fecal That pellet? was from a fec- that was from a rectal swab. A rectal swab, not a rectal pellet. swab. Okay. Correct. Rectal swab. So everything else was stone cold negative. Now, every single bat that we collected was identified because we don't just we don't kill bats. This is EcoHealth Alliance. They're very big on bat conservation. Mm-hmm. So they they capture the bats, they identify them morphologically, and then they take a wing punch, which is essentially atraumatic. The the scientist doesn't feel a thing. And then <laughs> And that goes into another tube, and we send that to the American Museum of Natural History where they do a cytochrome B oxidase PCR and identify the species. Mm -hmm. And for most of the bats that we identified, we were able to go back into the database and say, yes, it's this or that. Now, with this particular bat, there was no uh, sequence for a Tophosis perforatus, but there was another Tophosis species, and it was similar enough and distinct enough from the others that we presume that, you know, that there wasn't any mix-up in terms of the visual identification and what was determined genetically. And I kept, you know, I made a presentation in Cairo, and, you know, then I stand up and I say, look, I, look, I know I'm supposed to have 400 nucleotides, and I'm sorry, boys, and I can't grow it and what have you, but this is what we've got, and we've done all these other things, and I've spent my whole life debunking theories, whether it's born in chronic fatigue or MMR and autism or XMRV. So we're very sensitive to contamination. And so one of the things that was raised is says, how can you exclude the possibility that what might have happened is that the oligonucleotides that you receive from one of these synthesis, synthesis companies was somehow contaminated and that you introduced that? I said, well, if that were the case, then it should have contaminated all the other reactions because we did literally, we did done, ultimately we've done over 15,000 reactions. And we don't see it with the other ones. So, but I said, I need to go back and that's what we're going to do. So we went back in April, sent another team. This time we went to two other locations. We collected more bats and we have an enormous amount of coronavirus sequence, alphas and betas and so forth. But we never found that sequence again. And I mean, that's the long and the short of it. Now, the, the second time around, because I didn't want to spend, you know, six weeks in the field collecting bats and collecting them live and so forth. I focused, I had the group really focus on collecting fecal pellets. So, now you have to understand, this is Saudi Arabia, it's 120 degrees, and people are working in, you know, completely in, in containment. I mean, they're head to show, head to toe, booties to the top of their head, white, protective gowns, wearing pappers, which are these BSL-3, you know, roving BSL-3 machines. But I do have somebody who's there all the time, who works for me now for 10 years, who's sitting there labeling tubes and making sure that the right bat sample goes into this tube that's labeled appropriately. Everything is barcoded, and then it comes back. In those second set of samples, which we're going to write up, because we're going to describe everything else we found in these animals, um, we never, we haven't found it again. Now, is T. perforatus migratory? Um, I don't know the answer to that, and I should. I'm sorry. No, it's because it, one obvious possibility there would be if it if if that bat was carrying the virus and then it moved on, um, maybe others like it did, and this um, 
It, it, but you caught you caught other T. perforatus in this. That's correct. Year. We did catch. Well, we didn't catch many. We didn't catch many of those vi- though, many of those bats the first time around. I think it was three or something. So there weren't a large number of those. We d- we were we were expecting to see the virus in a vesper species because there's a lot of very very good work that's been done um, by uh, Christian Drosten, uh, you know, and his group and others. In, in in Africa and in Europe, and we found uh, related viruses and vesper species in South America and in Mexico. So that was our that was my leading hypothesis: is that was going if there was going to be something positive, that's where we're going to find it. And there have been objections raised by some of my colleagues that you know the fact that we're not finding it in a vesper bat is suspect. But you know the work that's been done by uh, you know looking at uh, receptor conservation for MERS coronavirus suggests that you find it in dogs and cats and pigs and horses and humans and and non-human primates as well as bats. So I don't, I'm not surprised that it would grow in another bat. Uh, and it doesn't mean necessarily that this is the only bat. And it certainly doesn't mean and uh, that this gentleman was infected by this bat or one of his colleagues. It simply means that the virus was clearly present in the environment close to where this man lived and worked. And how it got from some animal into him is a mystery that remain to be, remains to be determined. So you had serum from this bat, right? Yep. Did you check it for antibodies to the virus? Um, we didn't have any left. It was all extracted. Okay. You know, the thing is with microbats is you get 10 microliters of blood. That's why they're called microbats. You get 10 microliters of blood. So, because we don't kill these bats, we release them. So, by the time you're done, you got five microliters of serum to extract. So, it's not an easy challenge. So, Uh, my my question is you've got um, a virus that ordinarily has on the order of a 30 kilobase genome, 30,000 base pairs, and you've got 190 nucleotides of sequence that is an exact match with uh, the virus in question. Uh, Based on what we know about coronaviruses, uh, what, uh, how, how, how good evidence is that that uh, that match really identifies this particular coronavirus, or could it be something else with the same bit of 190 nucleotide sequence but a different coronavirus? That's a very good question. So um, Andrew Rambeau looked into this uh, when the initial sequence came out from South Africa on what was then thought to be the closest virus, which is one of the things that prompted us to suggest that we put this one out. That plus some discussions with the Ministry of Health of Saudi Arabia that eager was eager to see the material come out. And there were far more differences in that quote-unquote closest match than there were in this virus. Mm-hmm. So, And there were deletions as well. So this really is... This really is a perfect match. I, I cannot conceive of how, you know, how this could be contamination. I can never say 100% that it's not, but I just don't understand how it could have occurred. Could it be, couldn't it be a recombinant virus that has, say, the polymerase that matches this, and it's not really MERS coronavirus? I guess that's possible, um, there hasn't been any other example of an RDRP that looks like this, that's this close. I mean, the other thing is realize um, that, well, you probably haven't seen this yet, but in the next week or so, uh, collaboration between a UK group and Ministry of Health of Saudi Arabia is going to be released where they're looking at human sequences. And the, the, uh, the evidence is now suggesting that there are likely to be multiple introductions Mm -hmm. and there's a great deal more sequence variation than we anticipated in humans who were you know who have had severe uh, MERS and therefore um, the fact that this was identical to the EMC sequence right Mm -hmm. not some of the other ones but the EMC sequence suggests that there's a link so you have a geographic link you have a temporal link you have identical sequence over this small area, although, as I say, it, it, I, again, it's 190 nucleotides, so I can't exclude the fact that something else might have happened. 
So the EMC virus came from this site, is that correct? Yes. The EMC virus, so the initial case was this man in Bisha was 60 years of age. Okay. He became sick in Bisha, and his virus, his vi well, ultimately, the culture was obtained in Jeddah by Zaki. Right. And that was then forwarded, I think it was four or six passages, I'm not recollecting that at present. That was sent to Ron Fouché, who sequenced it, and reported that sequence, which incidentally is different than some other sequences that people now have. I'm not going to get in the middle of that. It's not my fight. But in any event, um, in this region that they report, this is identical. So it makes, you know, so it, you know, it looks like a duck and smells like a duck and walks like a duck, but it might not be a duck. But, you know, Could it, it be that the bat ingested something that had virus in it and it's just passing through its GI tract because you that's have no certainly, evidence. That's certainly possible. All we have, all we know is that there's a rectal swab right. that contains a fragment of the RDRP of a virus that was identical to the one that was characterized and cloned from the EMC. So virus. Ian, I have a question because um, the paper says that it was a fecal pellet from the bat that showed the 100% nucleotide identity. Well, if it's if it's a it, that but it was nonetheless it was collected directly out of the anus of the animal. Sure. Sure. Right, okay. Right. So and this then, what I'm trying to say is there's no question about which bat was associated with this. Right. And I just had a question um, by any chance do these bats get banded or anything? No, they don't. They okay. they're literally we they're they're captured, they're Micro, you know, their their wings are punched. The samples are collected, and then they're freed. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you're thinking of getting it back again, right, Kathy? Well, I bet you wish now you could. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wish a lot of things. You call uh, it the bat phone. You know. <laughs> so uh, the reason, the the reason you're here, and it it actually brings up a good discussion. When do you have a when when do you have a virus sequence and and a virus? Yesterday in the New York Times. An article was writ was published, uh, written by um, Don McNeil, and uh, the title is not bad. Mystery virus that's killed 47 is tied to bats in Saudi Arabia. But the first paragraph, health officials confirmed Wednesday that bats in Saudi Arabia were the source of the mysterious virus that has sickened 96 people in the Middle East. And I really took issue with that first sentence because, as we can tell from this discussion, we don't exactly know yet. So I wrote to Don, and he was very defensive about this, and, and then I started emailing you. So I thought we could talk a bit about, I mean, this, this sentence is clearly wrong, because we're not sure that this 190 nucleotide sequence has done anything, although there are good, there's good evidence to suggest it. And in science, as you know, that's what we would say, the evidence suggests this. But Don McNeil wrote, it's, it proves it, and he sticks by his story in his latest email to me. He says, I'm sticking by my story. So... I mean, you would agree, I'm sure, that we have not identified the source of MERS corona infections in people yet. Well, uh, yes, but that, I think, you know, it's a question of how thin you want to slice the prosciutto, Vinny. <laughs> okay, so, you know, I think we have been talking in the field, which is a very young field, about the origin of the MERS coronavirus. And there's been consensus, whatever value that has, that this came out of a bat. It didn't come out of a fish. It didn't come out of a, of a rodent. It came out of a bat, ultimately, because we, we have this long phylogenetic tree where we can look at the evolution of these viruses. So we do think it came out of a bat. Okay. Now, I'm not saying, and I don't think that uh, the journalist says that this is the bat that infected the man you know, that, mm. that resulted in disease. So, you know, if you take it to that, if you take it to that, you know, extent, then I would agree with you that the second, that that sentence is inaccurate. But I don't think that that's necessarily what he meant. It certainly isn't what, what I meant. And it's not what we discussed. Now, there are many people who comment on this, including some of my colleagues who are not virologists, who might jump to certain conclusions and change this. And, and if you think McNeil's story 
uh, you know, is you know, is suspect in this way. There are others that are more extreme. Sure. They're sure. more extreme. Sure. And there's a quote from someone in that article who talks about all the ways in which this bat could have infected this particular man. Mm-hmm. But you don't hear me saying anything of that sort because all I'm saying is that we clearly, I think that this is sufficient for me to say that this particular virus is circulating in that environment. That's what I'm saying. I don't think he can necessarily, this is sufficient for me to say he probably contracted it in Bisha rather than contracting it in Kuwait or some other place, right? That's what I draw. So, uh, if uh, do I understand that you have sort of other lines of evidence, phylogenetic and et cetera, that lead you to suspect the bat as a source of this virus? Yeah, there are many related viruses that have been identified. We found some as far away as uh, Central and South America. Um, Drosten's group has reported viruses that look fairly similar to MERS coronavirus in, uh, you know, in, the, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. There are even some viruses that look somewhat similar uh, in Hong Kong and in Europe. So, you know, it's not as though this is, it's not like this is the sudden appearance of Borna disease, right, or something like mm-hmm. that. This is, this is a virus that's related to other viruses that we see in other parts of the world. Okay. Right. That's, that's the evidence that I'm referring to. I can't tell you when it diverged or how it diverged or such like that. We don't have such, in, such information. Is there, any, is there any information on how the bats pass it around? Or do they pass it around? No, because we don't have a great deal of information about um, about how bats uh, pass around these other viruses. Now, there's a, as I'm sure all of you know, and if you don't, your readers and listeners um, should look at this. There's a wonderful um, review article that was written by uh, Charlie Callisher and Kay Holmes and... Mm-hmm. Um, Tony Schuntz and Jamie Childs a few years ago, I think it was 2006, that talks about bats as hosts for emerging uh, viruses. And it describes everything from uh, their social habits, echolocation, and so on. And I know that Science Magazine uh, is putting together something on bats that's going to be talking about why bats might or might not be reservoirs for viruses, and it's going to be expanding our work by Lin Fu Wang and others that examine things like, you know, their immunity and their, you know, their, you right. know, their oxidative potential and all these other things, which is very, very, you know, very, very elegant work. But we, so the answer is there are probably several things. One, they're probably, they're, you know, they're, they don't, you know, they simply don't kick out viruses the way other animals do. They have this echolocation, which results in these aerosols, and they live in these very, tight, clustered environments where they readily exchange this kind of information by aerosol. So, but we don't know, with respect to this particular virus, what's, what's key. So this uh, 190 nucleotides gives you impetus to keep looking, or are you done? No, I'm not, I'm not done. Um, we are, you know, the, the challenge in working in that part of the world is that there are logistics involved with importing materials that are different than in other locations. Uh, so we are trying to move some of our lab analyses there, um, which has its own challenges. Um, we, To give you an example, um, the bats I think we now have under control. We can move those around fairly easily. That's not a problem. But bringing in ungulate samples has been quite challenging. So we have a a large project right now, which follows on this very interesting report by Marion Koopman and her group that came out three weeks ago on the seropositivity in dromedaries, right? The mm-hmm. one hump camels. Right. And uh, that was, you know, it was 100% of this, this herd. I mean, that's a, that's a very compelling statistic and, and, uh, and a potentially important one in th- thinking about links. Now, when we wanted to, we've been trying to get camel serum out of Saudi Arabia for eight months. Three weeks ago, to bring out samples from 14 camels, a dozen sheep, a dozen goats, the samples flew into JFK, so that's in New York. They were met by a van from the Department of Homeland Security that drove the samples from JFK to Frederick, Maryland, 
where they went into the NBAC, which is the Department of Homeland Security facility. They were aliquoted by Jim Burns and his team. One sample then went back from each animal to uh, back to New York, to Greenpoint, Long Island, where they hopped on a ferry right. to go to Plum Island, where they were tested for FMDV. They were cleared for FMDV, <laughs> and at that point, the samples were released for PCR analysis uh, at NBAC and in New York and for serology in New York. And it took all of that and intervention at the level of the national security staff mm. to get through this thing of bringing in samples from ungulates in an FMDV endemic country. Now, so... Well, not just any FMDV endemic country, but Saudi Arabia. Um, I don't know... I Which don't I know. presume is the Homeland Security <laughs> involvement, right? Well, I, from any FMDV endemic country, I think you would have the same bar. You'd still have to go through Plum Island. I mean, this is a... Right, but not Frederick, probably. Well, for the people in Fred, the reason Frederick became involved was because I was, I was going to have to send these samples to Plum Island. <coughs> Excuse me. And if they didn't clear, they were going to be destroyed. Mm. This way, if there was something wrong, I could at least get them back on a plane and fly them right. someplace else. Okay. And Frederick is just a... Uh, convenient or, or an appropriate BSL-4 facility, yes. right? right? Yeah, that, the idea was, well, you know, the American Plant Health, uh, the uh, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service is part of the Department of Homeland Security now. So they have a facility on Plum and they have one in Frederick and they also have one uh, okay. in uh, Manhattan, Kansas. Mm -hmm. So they have several sites, but this was, this was, it really was a way of getting around this whole thing. So you had to have AFIN's clearance, CDC clearance, and the, and, and the reason I couldn't do it on Plum Island was because APHIS didn't want to have anything to do with a potential human pathogen. Right. And CDC <laughs> didn't want to have anything to do with a potential animal pathogen. Uh, and well, the only Plum people... Plum Island isn't really set up for human pathogens. Well, but, you know, it's just PCR and serology. Sure. Right? You know, so, but, but all I'm trying to say is the only people who have to do all of it is the Department of Homeland Security and, and uh, Columbia. So, you know, we don't, we're equal opportunity when it comes to pathogens. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so we're in the process of finishing that work now. It's proven to be very interesting, and I can't tell you anything about it, but it's going to be fun. What are you looking for? We're looking for nucleic acids as well as antibodies. Mm -hmm. And there will be many more such samples that are being collected. So FAO and OIE are now involved, and there's going to be a trip in September into Saudi Arabia to do a large collection mm -hmm. of various animals. And I, I have to figure out how I'm going to go. My last trip to Saudi Arabia was during Ramadan, which I do not recommend. Mm -hmm. So if you find nucleic acids and antibodies to the virus in a single animal, that would be more compelling than the current data. Are you going to try and get infectious virus? Are you going to try and culture virus out? Yes, and, and, I, and nothing would please me more than to be able to get all of those things. But you, you think it's not likely to happen? No, I don't, think that's, I don't think that's true at all. I think, in fact, we may. But I'm prepared to settle, you know, for, you know, for convincing, well-controlled evidence wherever I can get it. And, you know, if something's passing through a community, maybe all I'm going to get is right. antibodies. But the problem, with, the problem with antibodies, and particularly when you're talking about camels, Camels are very strange beasts immunologically. I don't know if you know anything about camels. I didn't know anything mm -hmm. about this till this year's ASV yep. meeting, and they really are weird. Yep, single chain antibodies. Single chain antibodies. They're rocking. You know, they're they're great. <laughs> they're great for uh, recombinant monoclonal body technology. It's yeah. a lot easier to put it together. But in any event, the point is, um, nobody really knows much about them. Um, you have to, you know, we have to determine what is baseline with these animals. We don't have a lot of secondary agents. The system we use for serology is called LIPS, which was invented by somebody at the Dental Institute at NIH. We use this to do all the, the uh, hepasivirus and astrovirus and herpes virus serology that we now do. It's, a, it's an immunoprecipitation assay, uh, which relies upon the fact that the FC fragment binds to staph protein A and G and brings it down, and then you read luciferase activity. It's a very sensitive assay, uh, and it's very easy to do, and you don't need secondary antibodies, which is great uh, in that vantage point, but of course then you need to do newts. Now the other question about newts, and I've been talking with a lot of people about newts, 
is that we Newt's tip is it, short for something? I'm sorry. There you go. <laughs> it's not a little lizard-like thing? <laughs> the I thing wondering how we got from the camels to the newts. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we haven't looked at newts, but there probably aren't many of them out there in the desert. No. Uh, neutralization assays. Okay. So, you know, uh, the assumption is that this is the gold standard, and if you've got neutralization, then by definition, you have a specific re- response. But that's not necessarily true. Mm-hmm. All that tells you is that the virus is unable to infect the cell. That's all it tells you. It doesn't tell you anything at all about specificity. So, um, you know, serology has lagged uh, behind molecular genetic approaches for characterization of infectious agents. There's nothing like rescuing a virus in cell culture, right? There's nothing like rescuing a virus in cell culture, and that is why you're still in business. <laughs> That's right. Well, I called him earlier today. He said, I said, are you in New York? He said, I'm in the hood. And I was assuming that he meant he's in the neighborhood. But he meant he was really in the hood passing cells. That's right. That's what we do. Um, I, I think that would be the ultimate solution to finding this virus other than in people, right? But I understand that you can't always do it. Serology can help. Getting more sequence from... Maybe the entire genome sequence from a single animal would be I great. think that would be terrific. And that certainly was the objective. Yeah. And uh, so the, the plan right now, you know, across this community, mm-hmm. is to do exactly what you've said. It's to identify animals as well as people who have live virus, to cultivate that virus, to characterize that virus, and to develop all the tools that, w- that are needed to do epidemiology and pathogenesis. So the pathogenesis is moving quite well in animal models. Right. Uh, so because we have virus from from, from people, people from right. people. So how how will getting the source help understand things better? Well, there's several possibilities. Of course, you can monitor mm-hmm. risk in the environment. You have so many and so many animals are infected. It's no different than what we do with West Nile, right? Sure. Where we monitor infected mosquito pools, or we monitor birds, whatever. You have sentinel events, right, with other viruses, yeah. and we would that would be the uh, the reason for doing that. Um, well, and you may be able to intervene at a particular point in the viral life cycle to prevent human cases. Right. Sure. That that too. But but I but I want to stress that we're we're not recommending. That people go out and slaughter camels or bats or any other animals. I mean, that's not going to be helpful. Well, that could even be dangerous if the virus is in them. It could be, but, you know, you remember what happened, you know, with the last outbreak of H5N1 in, right. in Cairo when people began slaughtering pigs. You know, sometimes these things, uh, you know, once they get into popular media, then there's a, it can result in a, you know, in a turn that you didn't anticipate. So don't go slaughtering animals unless you have an important guest. <laughs> but surely you would want to identify the virus in many uh, animals of different sorts out there, but not just one, right, before you would well, say I, this, is, this is the source. Oh, well, well, I would like to identify it in the minimum number of species. If we find mm-hmm. it in large numbers of animals, that would be of some concern. But yes, sure. I mean, I don't, you know, I still think the jury's out with respect to the intermediate host, whatever that happens to be. Right. Could be a dog, could be a cat, could be a rodent. I have no idea. But you think the primary source is likely bats? I think the I think the original source is likely bats. Whether it is a Vesper bat or is, you know, as a Tavosis bat, I don't know. But I do know and I would, you know, I'll take this one to the bank, is that that virus was present in Bisha. And the origin of his infection, I don't know, but I know that it was present in Bisha. Right. Well, I think it's quite clear that a lot more needs to be done. There's a lot of suggestive data, and I just hope that those individuals who have written articles about this, including Don maybe listening, uh, it's not a done deal. The smoking gun isn't there yet. And I, that was my main problem yesterday, was that these articles were written as if it were... And I'm glad that you uh, decided to come over here and talk about it. I'm always happy to come over as long as I can be a special guest. You can always be a special <laughs> guest. That's not a problem. Ladies, gentlemen, pleasure. Thank you, Ian. Ian, thanks, thanks very much. Bye-bye.
So much for an all email show. <laughs> <laughs> you have 40 minutes in. <laughs> well, we can. Uh, I mean, I thought that was important to do. Oh, oh absolutely. <laughs> it was fascinating. I, I love to hear the story. I, uh, you know, I had an email exchange with Ian and uh, Don McNeil yesterday, and, you know, it bugged me. And Ian, this morning, I was in the hood splitting cells, and he called me. He said, Why don't I come over and talk about this on, on Twiv? Yeah. Yeah. So that was great. yeah, that I, was that was great. It's Definitely great, helpful. and I I think the listeners will really like the story about you know doing the surveys and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. Don, if you're listening, you know, no harm meant, but I, we just want it. the New York Times has a big readership. We don't want people to think that the story is over, and that's why I originally objected. You know, we're all about getting the science right here. To do science, to make conclusions, you have to have the evidence and. We're not there yeah, and yet. I mean, I, I at least certainly understand the, some of the pressures that Don is facing. He's he's working for a daily, so his his deadlines are down to the minute, and he's got what seems like a story. And there's an enormous amount of pressure to um, to kind of round up certain facts that you know it ought to be like this. We're kind of we we're pretty sure that such and such is going on, and then you get a lead like that, which yeah. You know the the lead of that story was um, was wrong. Well, to me, uh, to me, some of the uh, compelling backstory here is that uh, because of the phylogenetics, they were highly suspicious. Have been highly suspicious that this is a bad virus to start with. Yeah, they had okay. excellent reasons for sure. looking at bats. I totally not that, agree. Not, not that it's a done. Not that it's a done deal. Okay. Right. But it's not like this 190 nucleotides is the only piece of, uh, of evidence. And, and this was news to me, is that um, uh, they had uh, other uh, bits of evidence that led them to be suspicious of bats to start with. Yeah, right. I, I, but we're not, we're not up to the point of being able to say that bats were the source of the virus that killed 47 people. No, right. No, that's, that's the problem, right? That's, that's what problem. I object to. And I'm right. sorry that Scott, that was Dan McNeil. You know, I had an email exchange with him, and he says, I stick by my story. He, he said, I think it's just two virologists arguing about terminology, but it's not, as you heard from, from Ian. So I'm glad he was able to come here, and I hope hope Don listens to it and others who have written stories about this. Um, and uh, Kathy has found that uh, review article from... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we... Uh, uh, last time Ian was here, he talked about a big study they did in bats, and... Uh, Oh, wow, that's all the way back in 2006. That's the Stone Age. No, no, no. Hey, we did we did hey. a, the no, article. No, no, no. Yeah, no, yeah. The article. Yeah, it is. But it's a good article. Yeah. I so my colleague Steve Goff was in here this morning talking about this, and he said, "I hope you get into this a little discussion about the pressures that both journalists and scientists are under to produce." And you yeah. just touched on that, Alan. You know, they have to write an article quickly. They have to get the headline. And in fact, in an email, Ian had said, "You know." Don didn't have much time to put this story together. Um, and scientists, too, are under pressure to discover stuff, right? I mean, mm -hmm. here he is yeah. schlepping a lot of people and money over to Saudi Arabia. He's under pressure to come up with something. And you heard him say, I wish I could give you 900 bases, but I only have 190. <laughs> so right. um, I think that's part of it. It's unfortunate because you'd like to have all the ducks in a row. Right before you make conclusions. Right, but if you if you wait for all the ducks to be in a row or all the bats to be in a row before before filing the story, then everybody else will have filed stories that got more readership, and you'll be out of work. But couldn't he have said, you know, the evidence suggests that bats may be? I mean, why did he I have mean, to be so definitive? I don't. When get you it. start watering things down, though, it makes for a less attractive lead. I was trying to come up with a better lead for this story, and and it starts to sound like less of a story. Well, if you just say bats in Saudi Arabia were likely the source, you know, that, that doesn't water it down yes. much. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, this, the sense is so definitive. And unfortunately, nature, too, you know, I just found an article looking through uh, nature. And they said, deadly coronavirus found in bats. Come yeah. on, nature. Bats have been pinpointed as a source of the coronavirus that has infected 94 people, yada, yada. It's pretty much the same lead as the, as the Times. Yeah. I think it's a very interesting result. He's, but you heard him. He never found it again in any other bat. And maybe they never will. It could be something else. Who knows? I just think you need to be careful. Yeah. Sounds, like the cam sounds like the camel story might get interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
So, yeah, I, I suspect they have stuff, you know. So We didn't actually cover the camel story, but we've been doing all kinds of other things lately. Maybe we should look at it next week. Or maybe there'll be something new next week. To, yeah, I don't. To do. yeah. You know, at we some can point, wait for we the ought to do an all-email episode. <laughs> <laughs> do you think? Uh, just, just an idea. It's only been 47 minutes. We could do some email. <laughs> we could do some oh, email. Yeah. All right. We need to do some email. Let's, let's do some email. We have some follow-up. Um, <laughs> all right. So I, I just want, <laughs> at the risk of <laughs> having another discussion, I had a bunch of emails from Jane Flynn, Dan Skalka, and Lynn Enquist about expressing a protein. So I just thought I would read this, and it's, I understand that not everyone is in agreement with this, but Lynn wrote, and this this all came in uh, after we discussed it last week on our uh, live stream show. Uh, Lynn writes, genes in DNA or RNA can be expressed to make gene products, but proteins cannot be expressed because nothing reads the protein to produce another product. DNA makes RNA, makes protein. Or RNA makes DNA, makes RNA, makes protein. Now, one should be able to express a protein because that means it is being made by translation, but one cannot say proteins are expressed. And then Jane wrote, genes are expressed, they carry information, and mRNAs could be, but why not say what really happens? mRNAs are translated, but proteins are not. They are made, produced, etc. They are information, if you like. This jargon, like so much other, has gained widespread use as people use phrases they have encountered in papers they have read and do not think about what they are actually saying. So I must I must say that Jane, you know, we have worked with Jane for many years, and she is very persuasive in these small rooms in which we uh, write our chapters. <laughs> and so over and over, you know, and if you write it wrong, uh, she, she makes a, a comment. So... I understand that uh, not everyone agrees with this, but that's that's how we use it. And as I said last time, we just want to be consistent in our usage. In a textbook, I think that's important to say something and, and have it mean the same thing throughout the book. And that's what we agreed on based on Jane's suggestions. Mm -hmm. Sure, so. sure. And, and I would just like to say that language evolves, and she even admits it, that sure. this has gained widespread use. And there are two radio shows and podcasts that I listen to. One is called Away With Words, and the other is That's What They Say. That's just a short segment on our local program. But the hosts of both of those shows frequently talk about how language evolves and how sometimes we might not like it, but it's it's they don't quite say it's a living thing, but uh, when something gains a lot of use, it then becomes the new norm. Sure. So, and, and to say, you know, my main objection is how do you say that in a concise way you want to talk about we're going to look at, to me, I can only say expression of proteins on the cell surface. I mean, you could say cell surface expression, but I'm still using the same word. So, everybody I don't know has... If that's, I don't know if that's wrong by Jane's rules. I think well, you, her thing is just you can't express a protein. So you, the common lexicon is to say proteins were expressed in E. coli. That's what she doesn't like. Okay, uh, but, yeah. but look, I understand, and there are a lot of other things: transfection, um, data, you know, all these things that have changed over the hey, years. And robust. really robust. There's nothing. There's nothing we can do about it except to say this is how we use it, and this is what it means. But I'm not even sure that that this is a case of language evolving. I think the meaning of express has always been somewhat dual. Um, in medicine, you can express pus from a lesion. Now, did you express the lesion or express the pus? Well, you did both. Mm -hmm. I think you ought to talk so, with Jane, okay? Because <laughs> she's I think maybe I should. She's way better at defending this than I am, okay? Yeah. But I understand, but I can't defend it because it, it's it's her origin, and we follow it. Because, sure. And we agree to follow it because it makes some sense, but I can't defend every instance. And, and I would certainly agree <laughs> that in a textbook, you do want a consistent standard. And consistent may be more important than than this debate about what the language means in the broader literature. Right, right. And you may, and you may have a little more space. You don't necessarily have to be so concise. You're not writing a paper with page limits or a grant with page limits or something like yeah, that. You can yeah, yeah. expand. That's funny. I got an email from someone who said, could you publish a list of the words that we're not supposed to use? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Electrophoresed. Uh, yeah, yeah you, you shouldn't say that, right? Proteins were electrophoresed. Uh, proteins were centrifuged. Or viruses were centrifuged. I'm not sure that's good. Either. Anyway, we could make a list. 
But kind of like George Car- Carlin's list. What's his <laughs> list? Uh, oh, yeah, right. Oh, he right, has right. a list of the words you can't say on television. It's I, I can't repeat it, but you can. Yeah. All right, Alan, can you take the next one, which is from sure. Kim? Kim writes, Hi, I just wanted to let you know that I managed to catch the live Hangout on YouTube for about 40 minutes. I was really surprised when I got home from the lab to see a live TWIV. The time when it was live was also perfect for me as a European listener, about 6 p.m. in Sweden. Uh, Do make it a habit. Uh, I would also like to add that I wrote in and got my letter read on TWIV 183. There I was asking for help, deciding if I should continue with a master in biomedicine or master in infection biology. Um, And those are the, I guess those are the um, uh, Swedish terms for them. Uh, To this, Alan answered that I think you're underestimating microbiology which I then realized I was. I've now gotten accepted and will be starting my master's in infection biology at Uppsala University in a few weeks. Thanks, Alan. Well, you're quite welcome, Kim. I'm glad uh, glad that was helpful. So uh, we did it at 11 a.m. Ah, 6 p.m. That's right. That's why. So I don't know. Maybe we should think about it because the Europeans could listen in. I really enjoyed doing the Hangout. I thought it was great. Yeah. Um, I think it was cool. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, can you do the next one, please? Sure. Robin writes, membrane proteins. <laughs> membrane proteins are deployed <laughs> to membranes. Deployment implies a purpose. While the purpose may not be obvious or easily discernible, it is not an unreasonable assumption that every protein has or once had a purpose. Serving in the Army adds to one's vocabulary, both printable and unprintable. That was one of the words we used for instead of expression, right? Right, or he's suggesting it. I can't remember. I, I can't remember if we used it. And then, so he kind of comments on a bunch of things from last week's show. The hullabaloo about publication of the HeLa genome is a reflection of an unstable phase in societal transition. The hierarchical structure that constitutes society makes every component, including the organisms that constitute that society, increasingly dependent on every other part of that society. This dependence includes ceding control to the societal structures. Domesticated animals and humans are no longer capable of faring as well in the wild as their feral forebears. The dependence is reflected in the shrinking of brain size in all domesticated species. Even human brain size has shrunk by about the volume of a tennis ball for the average adult male from that of our ancestors of 20,000 years ago. Even mitochondria ceded part of their genome to the nucleus. Concerns about the ability to buy insurance with one's genome laid bare arise because there are not yet in place the alternate societal structures that can provide the needed support and care. Such mechanisms will carry concomitant constraints on human behavior. Already, anyone who has recently served in the armed forces has their DNA in the military databank to permit identification of otherwise unknown remains. It is also perfectly legal to acquire a sample of someone's DNA from saliva on a soda straw, as in the Stephanie Lazarus case, or from clothing, even from someone else's blue dress, and sequence it. A day can perhaps be imagined when cord blood will be routinely sequenced and deep frozen, both to guide future medical care and provide a reservoir of autologous stem cells. The information could also be used in employment medical examinations to identify persons at undue risk from certain occupational exposures. If such a day arises, ar- arrives, the issues raised with the publication of the HeLa genome could seem quixotic. A fourth domain, and now we're talking about the uh, domains of living organisms, a fourth domain may explain why the viruses with large genomes have such large genomes. If organisms from those domains parasitized more familiar cells, they could have seeded only the limited number of functions that they held in common. If the parasitism started very early on, their preference for protozoans may reflect a difficulty in shedding their different ancient baggage. Could it shed some light on the radiations from our last common ancestor? I I wonder what Robin's job in the military was. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. This is really something. I th- yeah, I believe he yeah. was, uh, you know, so he is a retired ER physician, I believe. Uh, okay. May have done some medical Might related. Might have been a medic. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, the points about the genome are, are right on, basically. Yeah. You know, we mm-hmm. don't have anything in place to protect us yet. That's why people worry about it. But I think mm-hmm. at some point we will. And then at that point, the HeLa genome won't be an issue. And this possibility about the fourth domain of viruses is interesting to think about, yeah, I'm too. Trying to th- I'm trying to... I uh, think if I understand this is um, like uh, if the if the hosts uh, are 
extinct, you might have to hang on to a larger component of those ancient genes in order to get by in the other three domains. Am I thinking yeah. about this correctly? Right. That's, I that's think it. That is what that. an idea. Yeah, it's a good idea. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. They had to take it with them when they bailed out. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's a neat idea. Yep. Thank you, Robin. Rich, you're next. James writes, Kia Ora, folks. Um, what's that? That's hello in New Zealand. New Zealand. Ah. Hello. <laughs> uh, in TWIV 246, you talk about the agreement that was come to with the Lax family and publishing the genomes of the HeLa cells. Firstly, and quickly, Rich mentions the German group and how, quote, we're, unquote, in an age of HIPAA. Uh, that's the uh, information privacy agreement. No. The U.S. has HIPAA. Other countries have different Mm -hmm. systems that can vary a lot. Right on. That's correct. Coupled with universal public funded health care and the thought processes around the handling of genome data can be very difficult. It can be very different uh, to what you would think. Uh, Now on to the more thorny issue of the family. Yes, the HeLa cells contain the same basic genome that is present in parts of the children and grandchildren. However, how similar are they? The cells used were diseased and have spent decades mutating and being mutated in different ways, whilst descendants have ever-shrinking parts of this genome and have the much more stable parts. All the way back around TWIF 105, you mentioned the personal genome project that will put in the public domain genomes of people. Not the genome of some cancerous cell, but the genome of healthy tissue. How can this person consent in the place of their descendants to have parts of their genome publicly available with detailed history of the person that it came from? When do we say that a descendant has no further say in the release of data? For example, the great-great-great-grandchildren of Henrietta Lacks will have only one thirty-second of her genome. I do think the HeLa agreement is a useful stepping stone, but it is far from the end game as more and more of these genomes are released or leak out. As Alan said, it's a flimsy barrier when there are so many ways around it, even without access to the cell line to sequence yourself. And I seriously doubt that the final setup will look anything like what was agreed on with the HeLa genome. Please don't avoid these thorny topics as the discussion is important. We, we don't avoid them. No. We definitely don't avoid them. We charge into them. Yep. And uh, I, I, well, there you go. That's great. I think it's good when people uh, get uh, interested in these things. I mean, we talk about science papers, and then there are these issues, which I think are really interesting to people as well. Uh, this uh, it makes me think back to the letter we just read before. Robin's uh, letter basically points out to that, you know, the we don't have societal structures capable of uh, dealing with these technical advances yet. Yeah, okay, yet, they right. co- they co-evolve. We're working on it. Well, right. you know, in in 1950 we had nothing to deal with getting yeah. samples from people, right. and now we do. And you know, in retrospect, then you have issues. So. Uh, the next one, the last follow-up is from David, who writes uh, about TWIV246, which was our last episode. In week two of the Coursera class I'm currently taking, we learned that a cell is either susceptible, permissive, or both. We learned that a susceptible cell is a cell that has a receptor for a virus, while a permissive cell has the components to support viral replication. Enter this plant virus you speak about in this episode, which doesn't require a surface receptor. Does this now mean that all plant cells are susceptible? Are there any example of human-animal viruses which don't require a surface receptor? To me, this seems like a fundamental distinction, a principle of virology. (laughs) What a... Absolutely right. You know, we were talking about principles in that... In, in two episodes ago, right? And we don't mm-hmm. have many plant viruses because we think we got all the principles. But he's right. This is true. Uh, plant viruses, the viruses uh, don't need receptors to get in. They're delivered typically by insects or, or nematodes or fungi. So what do you say? Th- there's no susceptibility with plant viruses. It doesn't make any sense, right? Right. They operate on a fundamentally different principle. Yeah. So I, I emailed this to my colleagues in the book. I said, we have to point this out. This is really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is good. We got uh, TWIV listeners 
impacting your book. It's great. Yeah. It's great. It's the way it ought to be. Okay, let's go into our regular email, and many of which are ages old. Uh, Alan, you are up next. <laughs> okay, and we'll get through a little bit of it on the here at the end of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going for another four hours. Oh, right, right. <laughs> oh, you cool. I, oh, you guys uh, can leave. I'll just do them until there's nobody but me. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Alan. I'm sorry. All right, Steve writes, Hello, in order of, of first TWIV appearance, Vincent, Dixon, Alan, Rich, and Kathy, I plan on going through each TWIV podcast, starting from the beginning with TWIV 1, West Nile Virus. In addition to learning, I'll be listening for a type of statement. If there is anything you'd like me to capture from the podcast while doing this review, just let me know. I wonder what type of statement. Yeah, I don't know what, what that means, right? Okay. Um, I'll begin next week, June 10th. I'm guessing this review may take six months to a year to complete. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> Kathy, you mentioned... you mentioned. Uh, well, when I started back and was listening through all of them, and then, I don't know, around 50 or so episodes in of the original ones, and at the same time I was staying current, um, I was always hearing the statement, we should have so-and-so on the show, or we should have an episode about such-and-such. Yeah. Such. That's a yes. good idea. Let's and I thought, that. if I just had written those all down from the beginning, uh, we'd have a really good list. Yeah, so. I think that's what we should tell Steve. Capture suggestions, right? Uh, right? You know, if you really wanted to make it into a project, the show ought to have an index. Okay? An online it index? Wonderful. Something like that. Because we, people come up and say, have you discussed this before? Have you discussed that before? And we have ways of scrolling back through the episodes and finding them. But you can't necessarily tell what the content is from the titles. Okay? Um. <laughs> so I have, for each episode, uh, Rich, I have uh, keywords. So I guess I could take all those keywords and make an index out of them, right? Uh, you could, yeah. That would yeah, do search, it. Searching the twiv.tv site is pretty good. Um, yeah, that should search the keywords, basically. But okay. often you come up okay. with so many hits that yeah. you would like to have an index where you click on HIV and you get a list of all the episodes where we've where talked about that. Where it was a major that. topic. Major yeah, topic. But that, that, would be a, that would be a big undertaking. Yeah, I can't do that. That would be a big undertaking. Yeah, Steve, if you cannot. really feel like an additional project, right. <laughs> a <laughs> comprehensive a index of TWIV would be wonderful. Uh, but but it's sh short of that, I think this. I think Kathy's idea here is is really, really good, that we do frequently say we should do a show about that we should have so and so on and and yeah we've got this we've got a google doc that we put i i occasionally throw some ideas into but it doesn't capture anywhere near all of that yeah mm -hmm. yeah the other problem with building an index is that you'd have to keep it current and that you know so it's, it's a, a good work yeah. it would yeah. be nice if it could be automatically generated right but I listened to an NPR story the other day on trying to, uh, you know, index uh, video or audio documents, and uh, you know, it's a this is a technological challenge. I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure Make Google. Google is, I'm sure Google is working. They're on working it. on yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Kathy, you're next. The NSA okay. is probably working on it too. Yeah. Right, <laughs> <laughs> Eric writes, "Hello, Twiv doctors. I've just recently graduated from University of Connecticut with a degree in pathobiology and a minor in molecular and cell biology." Oh. I am passionately interested in viruses and how they interact with the immune system. I have a fair amount of research experience from a viral immunology lab that I worked in last summer at UMass Medical School, as well as some experience in a lab at University of Connecticut. I applied to about six PhD programs in microbiology immunology departments at universities across the country, but unfortunately wasn't accepted into any of them. Now I am looking for a research job that I can work at for a couple years, then I'd like to reapply to PhD programs. So far, I've looked into biotech companies, research hospitals, and even university research jobs in the Boston area. I must have sent out at least 20 or 25 applications, and so far, all I've met with is crickets chirping. I'm running out of ideas for places to apply to. I'm wondering if the TWIV crew or any, even any of the listeners have advice on, A, different kinds of institutions that I might be able to look into for research jobs besides hospitals and biotech companies, B, what I might be able to do to make myself a more attractive candidate for these jobs, or C, know of any virology immunology researchers in or near Massachusetts that might be looking for research assistance. I understand that this 
that this soon after my graduation, I can't be picky about jobs. Also, I know that the job market isn't exactly the greatest right now. I'd take any research position at this point. Any advice that you might have would be greatly appreciated. Keep up the great work with TWIV, TWIP, and TWIM. I'm a huge fan of all three podcasts. Kindest regards, Eric. So, uh, one of my first thoughts was, if you're just looking at research hospitals and biotech companies, that means you're not looking at all at universities or colleges where there might be some research jobs. Um, if there's any way that you can make personal connection, either from the people that you worked with at University of Connecticut or at UMass, and if they know of somebody or, or something that and they might know more about you and might be able to s- suggest if there's something um, to, if as you say, make yourself a more attractive candidate. Um, and one other thought I have is that uh, ASV sponsors a virology job site. And while I suspect it's primarily aimed at maybe postdocs and uh, faculty types of jobs, there might be something there that could give you a hint of where you might look. I think for uh, if if you really want to look for jobs in the in in research, uh, I would certainly be looking at universities. If you want to look in the Boston area, all the universities there will have job sites that you can look at uh, that'll tell you whether there are any uh, research assistant jobs available. And if you strike out there, um, my first inclination is always volunteer. And I would even be a little bit devious about this. I would suggest uh, looking at the different institutions uh, where and, and looking at the different departments, finding out what labs and research are going on that you might be interested in. Then cross-reference that with the NIH reporter database and find out who has money. Mm-hmm. And now with a uh, small pool, of, with a pool of laboratories that fit both those criteria, go and see if they need somebody to wash dishes. Uh, for free, okay, and then make yourself absolutely indispensable by volunteering. And I can't tell you how many people I've had who've come through my lab wanting to uh, uh, to to volunteer. And some of them, I, the key here is you have to make yourself indispensable. You have to be uh, somebody who sees stuff that needs to be done and does it and does it right. Okay, not somebody who comes and hangs around and messes things up. And, and the, you know, I've seen both kinds. And the ones, the ones that come around and mess things up and complain and, and don't show up on time, they outnumber the ones who are really good. And the ones that are really good, if you, if you uh, can make that kind of impression, nobody's going to let you go. They're going to find a way to keep you around. And, of course, since we've read your email on TWIV, if anyone in Massachusetts is looking for someone... Uh, let us know. We'll put you in touch with Eric. Yeah. And I would just add, um, I mean, you, he mentions sending out applications. <clears throat> um, applications require some follow-up, usually. It's worth calling a couple of weeks later, you know, just ostensibly to ask if they got the application, but really to remind them who you are um, and and just kind of get in get in the door a little bit that way and as Kathy said if you can make any kind of personal connection with any of these places that you're applying to that will definitely help too um, I mean a lot's going to depend on what your uh, what the fundamentals are of your application and but I, I it, it seems like even in this uh, sequestered budget era people must be hiring technicians and there's a certain amount of turnover among technicians because they go off to graduate school or medical school or what have you um, there there ought to be something out there for you oh there are I mean after and, all and Rich's, Rich's suggestion of volunteering is excellent if you can afford it after all the NIH budget is 30 billion so someone's getting money the money's and going somewhere someone's going somewhere I get lots of emails from people who are looking for tech jobs and it's just one or two sentences hey you know I'm looking for a job in New York City area I just graduated got anything and I pass them on to my colleagues and that's also worth doing as well yeah. All right Rich you are up next Isabel writes dear Twiv team I've been a happy listener of your podcast since I discovered a link to TWIV on Viral Zone, which is now run by my former former colleague, Philip Lemessier. 
I worked for seven years at SwissProt. I am currently with the Seattle Structural Genomics Center for Infectious Disease and gives a link to that organization. I heard that you are visiting Seattle in June. <laughs> Sorry, that already happened. And wondered whether you would have time to meet and allow one of our PIs to advise uh, to advertise our services to the virology community. Well, no, but it's now going to happen in the letter. Our primary mission is to determine the structure of 75 to 100 protein targets from NIAID category A through C agents. Those are really pathogenic dudes. Uh, as well as emerging and re-emerging infectious disease organisms each year for a period of five years. In order to do this, we seek the active engagement of the scientific community in nominating targets of interest for entry into our pipeline. This can be easily done from our website and involves no expense on the part of the requester. We also provide materials, clones, and proteins to the scientific community free of charge. About half of our current targets have been either submitted directly by the community, classified as community request targets by NIAID, or adopted by collaborators, community interest. NIAID is keen to have the community lead publications that describe or use our structures. This uh, is an example of a publication with a community collaborator and uh, gives a reference. Best regards, Isabel. Hey, do you hmm. think they, they express or synthesize the proteins? Ah, <laughs> they synthesize them, for sure. You know what? Uh, I could send these guys a couple of things. I mean, I don't know that, uh, I don't think Vaccinia is A through E, but Variola is, and it's close enough in the proteins that I want, uh, so that I could, yeah. Yeah. I yeah, got nominate, some ideas. Nominate your favorite proteins. I mean, I got, there's uh, a couple of structures I'd really like to know. And if these guys want to do it for me, that's cool. Yeah. Well, I figured everybody would like to hear about this, so mm -hmm. there you go. Uh, Mike writes, hello from sunny Florida. Every week I enjoy the content presentation and repartee on TWIV. Today in my RSS feeds, Next Big Future points to an article, Synthetic Biology Could Speed Flu Vaccine Production on MIT's Technology Review Site, and he provides a link to that. Would it be accurate to say that the steps involved in the process are gathering sequences from a virus strain causing an outbreak and using those sequences as a basis for chemically recreating, synthesizing the virus? If this description is inaccurate or grossly oversimplified, feel free to have a laugh at my ignorance. That no longer bothers me so long as I hear an accurate but still simplified explanation. You got it, uh, Mike. That's it. They sequence the virus, which can be done very quickly. And they synthesize uh, each RNA segment. There are eight of them as a DNA, and they put it in a plasmid. And then you can take the eight plasmids and put them into cells, and you get virus back. You can do it very quickly. So he, can, he continues, While it seems from the links that the time needed to create a vaccine might be greatly reduced, using this technique, how long does it take generally to isolate the flu virus when an outbreak occurs? Looking at the other end of the steps in creating a vaccine, once the proposed vaccine is created or available, how long generally does testing take? Apologies if these questions have been answered in a previous episode. Written near Daytona Beach, where it's currently 68 Fahrenheit 19C with partly cloudy skies. So currently... You, it takes about six months from strain isolation to having a vaccine that you can give to people for influenza. And that is because you have to isolate the virus. Well, actually, you need the sequence of uh, the HA and the NA. And then you have to make a reassortant where the HA and NA is from your outbreak virus. And all the other genes are from a virus called PR8, which grows really well in eggs. And then if it's similar to... Um, a virus vaccine that's already been in people, you do a very limited clinical trial, and so in six months you can be out there. But for the 2009 H1N1, the six months was too long, and the first wave of uh, the pandemic couldn't be stopped. So this will be quicker, much quicker, um, perhaps a month or so. Well, and because they say just to... Um Starting at 8 a.m. on Monday, the team began to chemically synthesize a viral genome based on sequence data. By noon the following Friday, the team had confirmed that it had live virus growing in cell culture. Infectious virus. <laughs> yeah. 
It can be that quick. So, Mike, you're right on. Mm -hmm. You're learning from TWIV. Alan, you are next. Uh, Hi, Tao writes, Dear Vincent, just finished listening to the new episode of TWIV. Not much comment on the um, H7N9, but you mentioned that you need a line of HeLa cells, which is a, a line of HeLa cells which is sticky to the culture dish and makes a flat monolayer. We have some HeLa cells in culture, and they attach the dish tightly. The cells grow really fast. Once they reach confluence, the cells kind of become plump and round, but they still attach well. Attached, please find the pictures of our HeLa cells. If it's the type of cells you're looking for, I'll be more than happy to send it to you. Um, P.S. In this episode, Rich called TWIV the weather in virology. In my last email, actually the only one to TWIV, I called it today's weather in virology. So you may consider to use that as a subtitle of TWIV. That's great. I love it. It's very good. I was a professor at Drexel in Philadelphia and works on Hep B. I was very excited when the Hep B receptor was identified earlier and we talked about it. So what you need are HeLa cells that are ACDC that'll go from cell culture to spinner and back and forth. And I had them. Right. I had taken them with me right. from the Baltimore lab and used them for 30 years and lost them last year. Because there are people who... I've been trying to, I, to locate them, so... We, there are people who carry HeLa cells in uh, monolayer culture, and they behave like that, and others who carry them yeah. in uh, spinner cell culture. But going back and forth is somewhat rarer. I'm going through people who have had the, the Baltimore cells and checking them one by one. Um, 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 who just did that, Alan? I just did that. Kathy, you are next. Jerry writes, hey, Doc, I'm a licensed research applicator, and I enjoy listening to your podcasts. My current job is bed bug identification, prevention, and control. I have witnessed an, a population explosion over the last four years in Los Angeles. Due to the population density of our urban environment, modern construction, hollow walls and carpet, and global travel, these creatures have been able to spread and establish themselves rapidly. I've been doing some reading on the potential of C. lectularius as a disease vector and come up with mixed information. According to what I've read, bed bugs could potentially transmit flavivirus and possibly lentivirus, but this has not been proven in studies as of yet. In addition, I know that the kissing bug, Reduvidae, can transmit Chagas disease. I would like to know what you guys think the potential threats are with bed bugs. I often see in heavy infestations blood spots from smashed adult bugs as well as droppings. Yuck. I would like to know yeah. I would <laughs> like to know what the possible threats are from bed bugs feeding as well as the diseases or parasites that could be picked up from smashed simex. And lastly, if the fecal droppings could carry Chagas or some other infectious agents. I know this is a touchy subject because bed bugs are common and people may panic. I have to calm people all the time who think rats have hantavirus, but I would like to know the truth about this. Is there a possibility that virus can pass to human from bed bugs? Uh, and then he has an, a PS, which maybe we'll read in a minute. But uh, just when I read this, we, we had it queued up for a previous TWIV. Uh, a paper came out in PLOS Pathogens, uh, uh, Pearls, these are mini reviews. And the title is Bed Bugs and Infectious Disease, a Case for the Arboviruses. And the authors say that most of the pathogens, most of the viral pathogens that have been looked for in bed bugs are not ordinarily transmitted by arthropods. But if you were to look at arthropod transmitted viruses in bed bugs, it might be more fruitful. So I think there's not a lot out there yet, but uh, maybe stay tuned for that. I think the article said that Maybe right. Basically, mm -hmm. the article no said out. maybe said we ought to we ought to have a look, and it all actually uh, reviews uh, pretty nicely uh, what's known about uh, bed bugs as uh, vectors for viruses. So it's a good. Yeah, it would be a good place to start. And it's actually quite bizarre that bed bugs are not known to vector any disease because mm -hmm. this is a species that it's a blood sucking insect. It feeds on different individual humans i i can't think of another potential vector like that that's not an actual vector i mean there clearly are viruses in them right it's whether they're transmitted to people or not is right it, and there are clearly viruses in many of the people who they're biting yeah. and there are and there are <laughs> going to be other diseases in the people they're biting they're biting and and just the idea that these insects can't transmit anything uh, it's possible, but it's weird. Hey, Rich, I see you handled this article. 
I did. Was uh, that like jo- submitted, uh, or did you solicit it? Uh, jo- Joe Heitman solicited it, I think, and cool. then it got passed to me. I think it's yeah. I I, I saw it, Kathy, when I was looking, mm. and I went to put it in the show notes, and I saw that you had done it. It's amazing. <laughs> it's so timely for my for not Mike. Yeah. What's his name? Yes, Jerry. 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 Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, I I just have to add that we have uh, a guy here at the University of Florida who trains dogs to sniff out bed bugs. And this, it's amazing. I've seen a demonstration for this. They're used to look for bed bug uh, contamination. It doesn't even have to be infest, infestation in various places. Just a few bed bugs, and these dogs go bonkers. <laughs> so, you, so these go into hotels? and Yeah, go into, take these dogs into a hotel, and if there's bed bugs, they'll find them. It's amazing. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And I meant to mention that the article is in PLOS Pathogens, so Jerry and everyone will have access to it because it's an open access journal. Yes. So, And then he writes, P.S. I have another request that is important to me. I had a friend, Tom, and he and I would debate the validity of the existence of HIV. Tom had it, but believed that since the virus was never isolated by the standards set out by the Pasteur Institute using a sucrose gradient and such, that HIV was not really proven, and he claimed that much of the illness was iatrogenic. I disagreed based on demonstrative evidence, although I must admit some of his sophistical arguments appeared to have merit. Some of the virologists whose works he embraced included Papadopoulos of the Perth, Australia group. He would state that the genetic sequences were from endogenous retroviruses. GP120 and 41 were not specific to HIV. The leukemic cell line used for HIV diagnosis was in and of itself somehow flawed. That protease inhibitors were nonspecific to HIV and they somehow helped people by preventing bacteria and parasites from proliferating. And that explained the efficacy of this class of drug. I know this is ancient history. My friend embraced his belief and bet his life on it. He did not treat for HIV, believing it unproven, and he was not a complete fool in doing so. He had what seemed to be strong support of his idea. He is no longer with us now. I believe he held on to his belief until the end. Tom and I spent many days in 1997-98 in a lively debate and learned a great deal about virology, thanks to a wonderful comprehensive virology book courtesy of Glaxo and a myriad of other related subjects. Do you have any opinion on these matters? <laughs> it was this experience that drew me to TWIV at all. It often reminds me of our debates. I know it would be a great podcast, and it is. I knew it would be a great co- podcast, and it is. Kudos. Thank you. Pardon the unpolished nature of the email. It's 2 a.m. I think he, he was a fool for not treating. Well, uh, he, if he, you know, he's no, no longer with us. Uh, t- case closed. But all of these things, I mean... You know, we could do a whole show on this. I get lots of emails from other yeah. people about the idea that HIV does not cause AIDS. And there's so much data which in- in clearly shows that it does. So The I- case is absolutely overwhelming. We even have, tragically, um, fulfilled Koch's postulates. There, there are right. laboratory infections that have occurred with isolated, purified virus. And those people developed infection with HIV. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So, now, those people generally went on to get treated with protease inhibitors and what have you, so you know they didn't uh, they didn't develop full blown AIDS. But this this is a lock. I mean, there are diseases where you can debate causality, but this isn't one of them. The sequences are not from endogenous viruses. The glycoproteins are in fact found in other lentiviruses, but they're different. The, the cell lines are not problematic at all. The, pro, the Yeah, this is another one. The idea that you treat people and they get better is because you're actually treating another infection is really completely unproven. Yeah. I don't, well, and, and uh, you know, it, you treat people and uh, uh, they get better for a while and then they don't and the virus resistance yeah, is correlated go. with that. Exactly. I mean, really. So what I don't understand is the mentality of this kind of denial. I just, it just, I don't get it. Well, any sort of, uh, I mean, denial is, a, is an immediate human reaction to bad news. And I think this is just a, an evolution of that, um, that somebody finds out they have HIV. Well, you'd rather not believe that that's true. And if it's true that you have HIV, you'd rather not believe that it could kill you. Yeah, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so. On the other hand, there are people who will try anything. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. this happened to be one person who didn't want to try what 
was already known to be effective. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the the CFS patients when XMRV story broke, they were many of them were willing to try antiretrovirals despite you know no proof yet. So that's just different people, right? Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I routinely get an email from a man who Martin in France who is now mad that we never read any of them. Uh, a lot of, of age denial type stuff, and I just don't think this is something we should spend our time on because the case is so clear. Now, if there are people out there that don't get it, I don't think they that no matter how much we talk about it, they will agree. Nobody who is still left to be persuaded is persuadable. Yeah. Let's do one more. Um, this, this is a kind of a, a neat one. Um, who read the last one, Rich? I did. Uh, no, uh, Kathy, Kathy so did. Rich so is next. That is perfect timing. Just perfect. I was wondering <laughs> if you planned that. No. <laughs> Joan writes, I love TWIM and will be using it in my course on microbiology for high school teachers. But as regards humans, empirical observation, and Jenner slash smallpox, please check the article at Welcome Trust. Uh, and she gives a link to a, an article called Who Got Credit for the First Vaccination, Jesty or Jenner? And then we filled in a whole bunch of other uh, links here uh, because that one was broken. But at any rate, we found it. And, and this, this refers to um, the fact that there was, and I don't, nobody disputes this, uh, there was a guy named Benjamin Jesty who 20 years uh, before Jenner, and now we're talking Jenner's, Jenner's observations were published in 1796, and this uh, work of Jesty's, I think, was done in 1774. Uh, uh, Jesty, uh, apparently, um, that uh, this is well documented as far as I can tell, uh, Jesty... Um, uh, vaccinated, that is, used um, material from cows who had cowpox to inoculate uh, his wife and his uh, children and uh, to prevent them from getting smallpox. And um, so there, when 20, and, but he never published. Okay. And when 20 years later, uh, Jenner uh, did a thorough analysis of the relationships between cowpox infection and resistance to smallpox, and then did uh, a controlled experiment that was an infection and a challenge. And later, actually, uh, his one of his relatives did a controlled, ex- a better controlled experiment where there was an infection with cowpox and then a challenge with smallpox, including a control where they took the same variolation material and inoculated another person and they got a the typical variolation response. Um, he then published uh, that stuff and it, when he did that, a bunch of people said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, we've known this, Benjamin Jesty did this 20 years ago. That's all true, but Jenner was the guy who... Uh, really um, did the controlled experiments, uh, did the appropriate uh, research uh, to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, verify that uh, cowpox conferred immunity to smallpox uh, and, and, and published it, made it public. So um, from that point of view, he's the person who really ought to get the credit for having made the discovery. Yeah, but he didn't. I mean, you know, the Chinese were doing variolation many, many years earlier. So right. So just, the note. So we just it, say it was done before. But as you said, Jenner did the controlled experiment. This guy just inoculated his family, and that was the end of it. You know, right. he said they didn't get smallpox, but he never really knew if they ever got challenged. In this fact. was an idea that was kind of floating around. And, yes. But Jenner, Jenner really did it and systematized it and tested it and, and <clears throat> published it. Yeah. It, the, interestingly, okay, so we can go back over this. The, the, there's two different techniques that we're kind of, uh, in a way, mixing up a little bit in the, com- uh, in the conversation. There's what was called variolation, 
And then there's what we now call vaccination, right. Right? Uh, and what was then called vaccination. Variolation is the practice of taking material from people who actually have smallpox and artificially introducing that by a variety of methods into uh, uh, people who are naive for smallpox. Um, most notably, the practice that was imported into Britain from uh, the Middle East in the early 18th century uh, was a practice where the smallpox material was uh, inoculated by scratching, scarification into a person's arm. Uh, and the, you got a, a really vigorous uh, reaction from that, a large area of infection with a lot of uh, pustules and a significant discomfort from that, and you were contagious for live smallpox to somebody else. However, your chances of dying from that uh, were about, on average, uh, uh, one in a hundred or less, which is uh, a 30 times better survival rate than getting infected with smallpox. So it was a very risky procedure, but it was better. But importantly, it sets out all of the principles, okay? It sets out the idea that you can artificially infect somebody. It sets out the idea that once you've been infected, you're immune. It sets out the techniques of scarification and etc. The innovation that Jesty and Jenner uh, introduced was using a related virus cowpox, which doesn't cause as much pathology uh, to induce the same response. And this derives from the observation initially that people who naturally got cowpox were in fact resistant not only to smallpox, but from the practice of variolation. And both Jesty, it was, as Alan says, pretty common knowledge, and uh, Jesty just capitalized on it and did it, but he didn't really follow it up, do it in a big way, do the controlled study. And uh, 20 years later, uh, Jenner really did it in a scientific fashion and followed it all up and, and published it. Yeah, so this wasn't just a case of, well, Jesty's a farmer and therefore wasn't accorded credibility, whereas Jenner is a doctor and is accorded credibility. Um, Jenner actually did a lot more. And nobody yeah, denies that yeah. Jesty did this. Right. Okay. Right. It's, it, this reminds me a lot of um, people often say, well, so-and-so flew before a uh, powered flight before the Wright brothers did. And, and there are a number of different claimants to that that are, some of them are, are quite valid, um, which is really kind of beside the point because what the Wright brothers did was really systematize the science of flight and come up with theories of aerodynamics and test them and demonstrate it. So it's, you know, Frequently, there are these concepts floating around that people reduce to practice here or there, but what you need is somebody to come along and really organize it. I had a little exchange. So this was actually an email sent to Twim, but I thought the, that Rich would really be the guy to answer it here and, and us. Uh, I had a little exchange with Joan, um, and she wrote... Uh, the Jesty story of vaccination ties in with the current citizen scientist movement and illustrates how social class affected scientific standing. And that's something you just debunked, Alan. Yeah, I, I don't think this is a case of that. I mean, that, that certainly historically there have been cases where that mattered. But usually when you delve into them, you find that there's there's there are class issues, but there are also other issues. Right. Um, you know, uh, Darwin and Wallace. Um, yeah. it, it I mean, wasn't, it wasn't just that Wallace was not of the same social standing as Darwin. It's that if you sit and read Darwin's work, you see that it's a vastly more thorough body of work than, and he credited Wallace. Yeah. And, and it's not like, uh, Jenner just waltzed into this. Heck, he had to publish it himself. Yeah. He, uh, he privately published it. Nobody wanted to publish it for him. And he was, uh, he got a fair amount of flack for it uh, initially, oh, yeah. at least from, from some corners, because people, you know, didn't want to believe it or, or were resistant to it from the beginning. But uh, in the end, it caught on big time. Well, I'm afraid we have to move on to our picks, and I cannot tell you how many emails we didn't get to. 30. Uh, 30. 30. Plus yeah. the other 100. No, we're in our queue, right. Oh, man. <laughs> what are we... What are we going to do? I don't know. Next week we could do an email. But right. what, what if papers on, on MERS and bats come out this week? No. <laughs> well, I won't be here, and so I won't be taking up all the airtime next week, so maybe you can get more done. <laughs> no, that doesn't make any sense at all. You, <laughs> That's not going to shorten it, I guarantee. It doesn't help in it. 
Oh, you're not here. That's right. You're somewhere cool, right? Brazil. Going to, going to Brazil. <sighs> yeah. If I like two months. No. <laughs> I'm going for a meeting and a seminar and some vacation. So, about so you're two not going to be here for, oh, just two weeks? Okay, it's two weeks in Brazil. And then we have ICAC. So, uh, yeah, I think we should think about doing email next week. Actually, it's just me and, uh, and Rich next week because Alan's right? away, right? Uh, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this next week. So, can you and I do uh, email, Rich? Sure. Yeah, right. why not? All right, let's do some picks of the week. And let's start with Kathy. Well, I picked uh, a comic by Fraz. It was one of the Sunday comics. And if you don't know Fraz, it's really worth getting to know him and adding him to your comics that you look at. You can read about him in Wikipedia. He's drawn by a fairly local cartoonist. Some, he's somewhere in southeast Michigan. And in this particular comic, Fraz explains rainbows. And since we had that really complete rainbow at the ASV during the banquet, it seemed very timely. And so Fraz is a elementary school custodian who is a, a writer on the side, songwriter, and uh, he made it big, and but he still works as a custodian because the custodians get the most respect of all the <laughs> students. And uh, you can read about all the characters, but uh, it's it's very literary. And uh, this one describes that, in addition to having rain and the sun at the same time, which pretty much we all know, um, it describes uh, where the primary arc is and and where the sun has to be, and that's um, just two shaka hands from the horizon. Uh, it's really good. So, check it I, out. I really like this, and I like Fraz. It's one of my, you know, I'm a comics freak, and Fraz is one of my favorites. I put him in the in the same category as Calvin and Hobbes. You know, yep. it's, it's really very good stuff. Yep. Cool. Thank you, Alan. What do you have? I have um, something I thought I might have picked a while ago, but I searched the site and realized I hadn't. Um, Challenge.gov. This is a site that um, the government launched a little while ago where they post challenges. Um, so they've got, they've got various problems that various government agencies are working on trying to solve. And they, um, they put up prizes for solving them. So uh, just an example from the current set that's on the front page, uh, there's a challenge to build a robot to return samples from Mars. <laughs> okay, there's a million and a half dollars in prizes riding on this for various um, <clears throat> levels of proposals and, and what they might accomplish. So NASA wants to do this, and they're submitting it here. So it's, uh, it's a way of uh, uh, crowdsourcing the, the problem-solving process. And, you know, people are always saying, well, they ought to do such and such. Well, right. if you're somebody <laughs> who says that, why don't you go tell them and, and cash in That's on cool. It. It's got all these categories, too. Yeah. So you submit a proposal? Is that how it works? Uh, No, what you do, you find a challenge. Yeah, exactly. You find a challenge that you think you can can address. Um, Let me just go in. And they describe um, what you need to do and, uh, and how to how to submit to it and uh, what the deadline is. Hmm. Uh, looks like the Mars robot period, uh, the Mars robot project. You've got uh, just a few more months to go. January 2014, they're looking for a deadline. So then they, they look at all of them and they pick one and they give they you the money. They look at them, they pick them, and they, and they give money to uh, fund the project, I think. I don't know. A million and a half bucks to get something back from Mars seems like... Well, no, it's um, I, I don't think you have to hand them a rock for a million and a half bucks. I think <laughs> it's I just think the idea. Just, yeah, I, I think this is like a grant application. Is there any virus stuff in here? Um uh, I didn't be. have to look it, if they want to make it's a, a it was relatively recently launched, so um, it's cool. Neat. You know, there's still I think there are only a few hundred challenges on it right now. I bet they get a lot of wacky proposals. We oh, got a hundred we got a hundred and four health challenges, um Vincent. Have a look. Yeah, look at yeah. that. That's cool. Rich, what do you have? Uh, I have a thing my son pointed out to me. This is a uh, a link to, I, it's a NASA site called Spot the Space Station. And what you can do is, uh, I once again, I was surprised we hadn't picked this before, but I looked through and apparently we haven't. Uh, on this site, <clears throat> you can uh, plug in your location. 
uh, and it will tell you when the space station is going to be visible uh, to you at night. And that's a function of not only uh, exactly where it is, but whether or not the sun's going to be shining on it. So, because you see the reflected light, and it'll tell you where it's going to come up and when and where it's going to go down and how high in the sky it will be. I've not yet seen it. My son just pointed out that my first opportunity is not until um, I think next Monday or even or even this uh, Sunday. But my son has used it and he said it's amazing. The thing really streaks across the sky and you can really see it. There's also, uh, I didn't uh, attempt to link these, but there are several um, mobile phone apps, smartphone apps, uh, either Android or iPhone. I've got one on my iPhone that must access the same data uh, and uh, do the same thing So and send you alerts when it's all going to happen. So I'm going to check this out this weekend, but uh, I thought that was kind of cool. It is a really neat yeah. site. Yeah, I yeah. signed up for this some time ago, and I get the emails. I never go out and look, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but I, it is cool. I'd like to see it sometime. Well, it's going to be Monday. I think it's this Monday. It's going to be 71 degrees up for me, so I'll have to make the effort and go out and see it. Yeah. Well, and for me, now that I know that uh, 42 degrees is two shaka hands, I, I'm looking for the ones that are about that. So. <laughs> nice. Well, I thought I would pick 23 and me based on our discussion last week. Uh, this is basically a site where you... Send them your saliva, and uh, they extract DNA from it, and do a screen of known polymorphisms, that is, nucleotide differences in the human genome that are associated with traits and ancestry and specific diseases. And um, it costs 99 bucks for the first member of your family and $80 for everyone else. And I had everyone in my family do that. I originally did it for one of my sons because he's had some medical problems and I wanted to see if this would by any chance shed any light on it, but it did not. And then I figured, let me do everyone else. What I find really cool about this um, <clears throat> is the ancestry. So um, I I opened up all my results to anyone on 23andMe who wants to see them, in uh, consistent with what I said last week about my genome sequence. And... Um, then these people who you can identify other people who are second and third and fourth and fifth cousins, right? Related to you. And this one guy who was a second cousin emailed me and I hooked up with him and he lives in the UK and he was, his mother was born in the town in Italy where my father was born and mm. probably is related to me because this is a town in the middle of nowhere with, you know, a thousand or 2000 people in it. And I just was blown away. Wow, and this was identified by by you know polymorphisms that are known to be in certain populations. It is so cool. So you know, it tells me I'm ninety five percent Italian, which is not surprising because my my ancestry is pure Italian. But a lot of cool stuff, and there are lots of other cousins on there that I could hook up with. Now, so the the disease polymorphisms didn't tell me anything, but the ancestry is cool. It tells you what percent Neanderthal DNA you have. So I have 2% Neanderthal DNA, which may explain some things. Um, and they can trace population migrations based on so, certain So did they actually sequence you, or is this just No, it's just polymorphisms. Polymorphisms. Yeah, so it's basically a, uh, a chip assay where they hybridize your... They amplify certain regions of your DNA and hybridize it to a chip, and you can tell very quickly if you have the polymorphism or not. So they don't actually sequence your DNA. It's just a So a chip th And this is ni 99 bucks? Yeah, All right. and they they actually have um, they have a got it used to be like four hundred and they got a grant um, to to cut the price down because clearly the power here is to have a lot of people and and their histories they ask you lots mm -hmm. of questions and I just think it's really cool to know this stuff and I could actually download all the data and put it on my website which is something that I'd be happy to do but nobody cares so anyway it's a really cool place and if you the cool part is if you have a family and you want to see the uh, ancestry uh it's cool to do that so um i really like it this is uh 23 and me which is actually found one of the co-founder the people who founded it are out of stanford university one of whom is uh, i believe the spouse of one of the google founders 
So thinking about information all the time, I guess. It's pretty cool. We, um, the next email on our queue was actually a listener pick. So that's from Frank, who writes, Hello, Twiv. Thanks to all of you at Twiv, and keep up the good work. I heard the popular news report on pacifier cleaning by parents and the possible effects that it might have on autoimmune disease. I looked for the source and found it in the journal Pediatrics, and he provides a link. thought it would make a good listener's pick. I'm also interested in the panel's take on this article. <laughs> so this is an article that came out too long ago. Not too long ago, pacifier cleaning practices and risk of allergy development. So they basically did a study of 184 infants, and they they looked at whether the parents cleaned their pacifiers or s- by sucking on it, and whether that correlated to having asthma or not, or eczema and other kinds of allergy diseases. So basically, parents sucking on kids' pacifiers makes it less likely that they were going to have asthma. Well, according to this study, there's a correlation. There's a a correlation in this cohort. Right. um, Which, of course, I mean, there are other things that could have confounded this, obviously, but, you know, it's a small study and so forth. But, you know, the implication or the suggestion is that the microbiome that you acquire from your parents sucking on your pacifier may impact your asthma. So clearly this is a very preliminary study. I mean, their conclusion is parental sucking of the infant's pacifier may reduce the risk of allergy development, but I mean, I think it's tantalizing, but clearly a lot more work needs to be done. I was uh, fascinated to discover that parents think they're cleaning their kid's pacifier (laughs) by sucking on it. (laughs) Really? I know. Wow. I never sucked on any of my kid's pacifiers. That's just pretty... (laughs) interesting to me anyway it's a cool it's kind of an interesting article so check it out and thanks for that frank i think it's my take is it's preliminary and we need to do a lot more work you'd yeah. like to know what the microbiome was of these kids and how it correlates that's that would be not just the fact of sucking the pacifier but what bacteria do you have acquired and how that impacts asthma that would be the study to do right yeah there's, uh, there's a whole um literature of this uh, hygiene hypothesis of asthma development and autoimmune disease development that um, uh, if you don't have adequate exposure to microbes in the environment, that may predispose you to develop um, these sorts of diseases. And and there are studies showing that households with pets, the kids are less likely to develop asthma and um, siblings, they're less likely to develop asthma and yada, yada, yada. So this, this is all part of a... <clears throat> an evolving picture but in all of these cases they're they're usually confounding factors so it's really kind of early days to yep. to make a specific recommendation but clearly well, the first step in in doing more work on this stuff right i'm sure, really yeah, it's an I, interesting thing to look at i'm really heavily biased because i really like the hygiene hypothesis i think yes. mostly because all of this hand washing stuff I mean, the extreme hand-washing stuff and all the hand sanitizers and everything else, for some reason, it just rubs me the wrong way. I like germs, you know? <laughs> eat, eat dirt. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. My mom always said, you eat a bushel of dirt before you die, so don't worry about washing that off. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's an interesting one. <laughs> a bushel of dirt. Twiv is found at iTunes and twiv.tv, and we do appreciate if you go over to iTunes and leave a comment or a rating to keep us more visible there in the crowded Apple iTunes directory. Subscription Apple recently announced by the way that subscriptions to podcasts on iTunes reached the 1 billion mark total subscription so we're part of that. And uh, we need your help to sort it out. Do send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv and I want to alert everyone to the fact that there is a upcoming American Society for Microbiology meeting in Denver. It's called ICAC. It is, uh, and we will be doing a TWIM and TWIV uh, from there. You can find details at microworld.org slash ASM live, one word. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan. Thank you for joining us today, Kathy. Thank you. This is fun. I hope you have a very nice trip to Brazil. I do, too. I'm looking forward to it. You're going to be in Rio? No, that's one place I'm not going to be. 
But mm. I'm going to be in Sao Paulo, Porto Segura, Faz, and uh, Bonito in the Pantanal, and Hibiero Preto. Great. Wow. I, I hear that the meeting that you're going to is in a very interesting place this year. Mm-hmm. It's physically very beautiful. So enjoy that. Say hello to your eco for me. Of course, I will. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida, Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Great fun. Have the heavens opened up? Uh, matter of fact, I've been watching a flood while this is going on, but um, <laughs> it, that, ha- that has since receded. It was, it's all been very interesting. Wow. <laughs> there's, wow. A creek, there's a creek uh, pretty just going up the hill from me, and when it really rains heavily, that floods, and it was, it was pretty amazing. Did you uh, build a Condit Dam? <laughs> no, no. You remember that, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.